May the grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you this Sunday morning. I would like to welcome each of you to worship today. Those are here, who are here worshiping in person and those who are worshiping with us at home. Um, I would like to extend a special welcome to anyone who's visiting with us today. Uh, I would, uh, would like to remind you to pass the, the, um, the welcome friendship pads down to the end of your row and let us know that you're here. And uh, if you are visiting, we'd love for you to put your address in there so we can get in touch with you. Um, before we get going with worship, I'm going, today is a very, very special day. It's uh, our Christian education uh, kickoff, and so I'm, Elizabeth is going to be doing a lot of things in worship today, so I'm going to turn over the announcements to her. Good morning. So uh, this is a little earlier in the fall than we usually do our Christian Ed kickoff, and that has to do with a couple of different scheduling things, but um, uh, we hope that you can all join us. The activity right after worship is in the Crawford Center. It's for all ages, which doesn't mean that it's for children and adults can join it. I promise it's for all ages, and we will be um, playing some games together, exploring what characters we might know or not from the Bible, and um, uh, having a moment to speak about how God calls us to learn at all ages. So uh, there will be a light brunch provided with um, Biscuitville biscuits and Southern Angel uh, donut holes and Judy Laut muffins, and several other um, wonderful things. So we hope that you'll join us right after worship. Um, because it's the kickoff today, that means we have youth group tonight for our first session. Uh, so that's 6 to 8 tonight. Uh, we will be in the Hogan House for dinner at 6, and then we will be outside, weather permitting, uh, playing a game, and come dress to get wet and paint on your clothes. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, we do have nursery available this morning. Um, in order for us to continue to provide that, we need a few more volunteers on our list. So if you are willing to do that uh, one Sunday a month or one Sunday a quarter or just one Sunday, please let me know. Uh, oh, and uh, we do need some tutors for our Tuesday tutoring. We have a waiting list. Uh, and so if we, if we could have more tutors, then we could offer this to more students. So speak with Anna Stevens if you're interested in learning more about that. Thank you. I would also like you to know that this is the last week that we're going to make it easy for you. So if you look in your bulletin, you'll have found a little piece of paper where there's a sign up for our, for our um, work, flowers for worship. And you can sign up for any Sunday in the given year uh, to provide flowers if you want to dedicate them to someone, um, put them in, as, in honor of someone. We will get on that awful computer and we will do that for you if you just fill out that little form right now and then you put it in the offering plate when it's passed by. And then we'll take that into the office and we'll sign you up. But this will be the last week we're going to make it easy. After that, you're going to have to get online yourselves. So it, I think that is all for our announcements. And so let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
and a call to worship that's printed in your bulletin. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, If the Lord had not been on our side when enemies rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger toward us. Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us. Then would the raging waters have gone right over us. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us over to be prey for their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowl. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Our first hymn is number one in your book. I don't remember ever doing that one before. Um, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Please offer your silent prayers of confession. Amen. You are a chosen race, a holy nation, God's own people. 
in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of the darkness into marvelous light. No, once you were not a people, and now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now we have all received mercy. Amen. the children join me up front for the children's moment? Good morning, guys. Thank you for bringing your backpacks this morning. So, school starts tomorrow. Is it tomorrow for everybody? Is it tomorrow for you too? How are you feeling? Sad. <laughs> Sad because summer's over and we have to go back to school. Yep, yep. What else are we feeling? Excited? What are you excited about? You don't know? Okay. Excited? You're excited about lunch? Mm -hmm. What'd you say? You're feeling weird? I can understand that. Yeah. Nervous. Yeah. I was always really nervous. Yeah. What? Yeah, that can be hard. Yeah. Excited and happy. Yeah. So we can feel all kinds of feelings, right? And we can feel ones that don't make sense together at the same time, right? But you want to know something really cool? God is with you as you start school tomorrow, no matter what you're feeling. If you're excited or you're nervous or you're happy or you feel weird, God is still there because you matter to God. And you know what? You also matter to all of us. And so we will all be praying for y'all tomorrow and all of your friends and your teachers we're going to do more prayers about that today, too, but you will be in our prayers tomorrow because the start of school is a big deal, yeah? So I have these cool tags that you can put on your backpack if you want. What do they say? Can you all read them? You matter, right? I just said that, didn't I? Okay, so and then on the back they say, you matter to God and you matter to your church family at West End Press. And you can put this on your backpack if you want, and it can remind you that God is with you at school. If you don't want to put it on your backpack, that's okay. You can put it on your keys or somewhere at home or on a bracelet. Whatever you want to do, it's yours. Okay? Here. Can you hand, make sure everybody gets one? Yeah. All right. So now that we have our backpack tags, I wanted to do a blessing. What's a blessing? A prayer. When you get blessed, yep. Mm -hmm. So we use blessing in a lot of different ways, right? So when we say, does anybody's family call it the blessing when you say a prayer right before you eat? Yeah, okay, so that's one kind of blessing. Sometimes a blessing is a prayer done in other situations, right? Sometimes we talk about counting our blessings, right? So we're talking about gifts from God, right? So, but sometimes at church, we do something special and we call it a blessing and it's when we want to 
make sure we're all aware of how God is going to be with us when we pray and when we do whatever we're praying about, right? So we're talking about how God is with us at school tomorrow, so that's what our blessing is going to be about. But we're going to do something. I'm really excited. I hope that everyone else will be excited too. So in just a minute, not yet, we're all going to stand up. And if you're on this side of the sanctuary, you're going to filter over here so that we can put our hand on the shoulder of someone in front of us so that we can pass that down so that we can pray and do our blessings so that our, we're all laying our hands on our kids. Is that okay? But don't, you only have like one or two people with their hands on your shoulder. Is that okay? Are you all good with that? Are you all good with that? Okay. <laughs> you do only have two shoulders. I think people could put their hands on top of each other, though, right? Wouldn't that work if we needed to? We'll see. If you are a middle or high school youth, I do have backpack tags and stick. Can you all hear me now? Ah, okay, so you all didn't hear me give any of those instructions. So I apologize. Um, we're going to stand up, and we're going, if you're over here, you're going to slide over and stay standing, and we're going to put our hands on each other's shoulders so that we can put our hands on the shoulders of our children and youth while we pray for them going back to school. So, okay. Um, how about youth? Will you all stand? Go in the pew right here behind them. Perfect. All right. Yep. And if you are upstairs and don't want to come down, that's okay. You can um, just put your hands over the balcony or up like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you are uncomfortable with somebody touching you, that's okay. Stay in the aisle and, and you can have someone just hold their hands near you. How are we doing? So the whole point is that even though we can't all be standing right next to our children and youth, we are all laying on our hands, honoring God's blessing for them by passing it down. Oh, do we not have anybody? Hey, Tanya, can you go stand like between Jackie and the other people so there's somewhere for <laughs> Okay. Are we good? Are we good? All right. This is not a repeat after me prayer. Let us pray. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, we bring ourselves, our big feelings, and our backpacks to you. In our backpacks, we carry blank pages, sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, and in our hearts, we carry big feelings unanswered questions, and hopeful expectations. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring, of what we might learn, who we might meet, and who we might become. God, our friend who is always with us, be with us through it all. Be with us as we ride the bus, as we walk, as we buckle seat belts, zip up jackets, and tie shoes. However we get there, and whatever we wear, Bless this journey into something new. For the grown-ups going back to school, with us, God, be with them too. Thank you for our teachers, helpers, caregivers, and leaders, and for all they do to help us learn and grow. God, our friend who's full of wonder, fill our hearts and bless their hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, youth, you can take a sticker or a tag, whichever one you want. Okay, let's make sure everybody gets one, and then we can sticker or tag. You can pick. Sticker or tag. Okay? Sticker or tag. Tag? 
Sticker or tag? Tag. You want a sticker? Okay. Okay. Here, keep the tag, take it home, and take a sticker. Okay. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today our first scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 through 11. It is found on page 640 in your pew Bible, if you'd like to read along. And you should. There's a lot of bugs in this one. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me and my nation. For a teaching will go out from me and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Listen to me, you, know, you who know righteousness, you people who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others, and do not be dismayed when they revile you. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my deliverance will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The word of God for the people of God.
Today's second scripture reading comes to us from the Epistle of the Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our Lord, our Rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. The epistle to the Romans is Paul's greatest and most complex theological masterpiece, if you will. Out of all the possible passages to preach on, it is my least, possibly one of my least favorite. It's, it's safe to say at least it makes the list of my least favorite. It makes that list simply because it is indeed complex. It is indeed dense with material and in true Pauline fashion, seemingly contradictory and always confusing. But here is another secret that I will share with you, and it may shock some of you. I already shocked Elizabeth earlier. I absolutely love Paul. Paul is one of my favorites. I adore Paul. And I know that probably shocks many of you, especially many women, who probably realize that Paul has not always been accepted or believed to be pro-woman, right? We readers, you know, just to remind you, we, we readers meet Paul in in stages along his journey. We know quite a bit about Paul, but as a reminder of who Paul or Saul is, I want to go back and tell you, um, he's kind of that guy that puts his whole heart in everything that he does. He's that guy that, as one of my former pastors said, he is zealous for God. He Whatever he did, he did with every bit of his heart, his mind, and his body. Well, he was uh, not always going the right direction, as we may know. Um, Paul used that zeal in different ways in the very beginning. He was called Saul then. And in the beginning, he was kind of going in the wrong direction. Remember, he was a great persecutor of Christians. He zealously persecuted followers of Jesus during a time where they were putting them to death. Christians were against God in Paul's mind and must be stopped. His mind was made up. He was convinced of his position, and with certainty, he was relentless. But for all his zeal and determination, it was nothing compared to the zeal of God. It reads in Acts, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, and he went to the high priests and asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, And he fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul responds, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So, from this moment, Jesus guides Saul on in a different direction, complete opposite direction and gives him a new name, a name we know to be Paul. And Paul uses that same zealousness and energy 
and directs it directly into the spreading of the gospel. And just to give you a hint, he does a really good job because a lot of what we have in our New Testament are letters and epistles that reveal as much, such as my least favorite, the letter to the Romans. So we're back there. My second reason for loving Paul, because of my own transformation. When I was taking my undergraduate studies, I had a professor from Princeton who was a devout feminist, might we, what might we say? And she did a class uh, that really changed my mind about Paul. You know, before that, I believed that Paul was totally against women, and on first glance, if you know the Pauline epistles at all, you know that it doesn't sound like he's pro-woman. But I discovered in my studies that Paul was actually a man who promoted women. He was actually a forward thinker and encouraged their preaching and participation. Who knew? Paul's a feminist. Oh, my goodness. It just took some time for me to learn how to read it and understand the text as it was written. I already had preconceived ideas about Paul before that. The third reason that I love Paul, and the most important reason, really, with all his history, with all his successes and his failures, with every fiber of his being, and with every ounce of his body, his mind, and his spirit, Paul loves God. Paul desperately seeks to please God in every way. And if we really think about it carefully, it couldn't have been easy to be Paul. Paul had moments where he had to deal with the painful realization that what he thought was right and what he thought and believed was the will of God was actually not God's will at all. So that brings me back to today's short three verses. Paul's direction for followers of Jesus, that's us, uh, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, he writes. You know, when we think about sacrifice, especially in the Bible, we we usually think of an end. Um, It's not something that's usually living. Sacrifice is well dead. In familiar form of the sacrificial system, we know that whatever was presented as an offering before God wasn't going to live long. It was It was death. It was to give life to God, meaning death. And Paul retains that in his example in this epistle. But he changes it just a tinge. He he wants us to know there's something about what we're giving God that has to die, but he wants us more to know that what we're giving God is a living sacrifice. Something has to die and something lives. Indeed, uh, Paul wants Christians to know that living out your faith and following Jesus is not a small, insignificant offering, but one that will require a death of some type and a birth of another. Paul really did wrestle with the question, what does God want? Think about Paul all the way back. You know a man who loves God that much and has gone to such lengths to serve God, either rightly or wrongly, has really wrestled with the question, how can I please God? What makes God happy? What, what, what does God want from me? What, what would bring God happiness about my behavior and the things that I do? And even after the Damascus Road, I think Paul continued to ask that same question as it came up again and again in his letters. Something fueled his desire to be zealous for God. Something promoted him to love God with every bit of his life. So in this passage, Paul is not suggesting that we bring our entire selves to worship every Sunday as a living sacrifice. He's telling us He's telling all of us, all of us readers, that when we die to self and live to God, 
that everything that we do in church or in home, work or in school is worship. That's, hold on, let, let, me, let me pause in that for a minute. That sounds weird, right? Every bit of our day, from rising to going to sleep, to going to work, to going to school, to the phone calls that we make, to going to the post office, or even going to the grocery store, is worship. Because worship pleases God. In other words, if we're living as Christian disciples, if we're, if we're following the precepts of God, if we're living rightly and we're following in those footsteps, then we're living out our life and our Christian life in a way that pleases God and is worshipful to God. That doesn't mean you can't come to worship on Sunday. On the contrary, that is all part of living a life of discipleship. So, he goes on, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. <laughs> well, that's the easy part, right? It's easy. Everybody knows what pleases God. Especially now, we Christians are experts. We know it all. We learn at an early age what it means to be good in church. Or perhaps we learned it from our parents or our grandparents or our friends. Or even out in the world, we learn basic moral principles we know what it means. We know that God wants us to be good. God, simple. God wants us to be good. And God calls us to love one another. If we can hold those two in our lives, then we're probably knowing what it means to be Christian. We're pleasing God. We're doing what God wants us to do. Simple. Right? We would like to think that wouldn't we? In fact, I think every one of us has a notion of that in our head at some point, and probably right now. I know I do. But being Christian, friends, and living out faith is far from easy. It is not simple. It is hard. The thoughts the relationships, the actions, all of it is not easy. And perhaps believing that being Christian is easy is prob and being certain of that fact is probably one of the most destructive lies that we convince ourselves of because it is believable enough to go unchecked. It's believable enough that we believe we're doing the right things that we let it go. We don't attend to it. We convince ourselves we've got it right. We're experts by the time we're in our 50s, 60s, 70s. We don't need to learn anymore. We have it memorized. And it goes unchecked. Perfect example, Saul, Paul. He believed he was pleasing God, did he not? Zealously. He was undeniably convinced. We can point fingers at Paul, but we're all guilty. We're all guilty of it. We're, we are human and we get this idea in our head that God wants it a certain way, and we rarely stop to consider if what we're thinking God wants is really what God wants. If the life that we're living, if the things that we know and the things that we say and the things that we do are really what God wants and what pleases God. Discernment, which is where Paul goes in this text, is the active part of living with God and learning from God and continual prayer, a continual prayerful pursuit of God's always changing will. And most interesting and most beautiful of all is that discernment is not something we sit at home and do on our own. We cannot discern on our own. Just like we cannot be Christian on our own. We are part of a body. 
We are part of a body of believers, and the only way that we are doing things rightly, living out our Christian faith, is by doing it within the body. We are part of the body of Christ, and within that body of believers, we are able to truly live and grow as disciples. It is from within that body, the body of Christ, that we are Christian. From within that community, we are growing in faith and continually learning through our service, our relationships, and our study. Within that body, we more easily see where we get it wrong, and we find affirmation when we get it right. From within that body and all that it does, we are living sacrifices in the body of Christ, with all our differences, successes, and failures, we are redeemed and forgiven. Living fully and living out your walk with God requires being part of this body and being part of the body, which is the church, the people of God. uh, It means that you're required to grow and to learn and to participate, not only in the actions of the church, but in edification, edifying yourself. It's really easy to think that by coming on Sundays that you're being fed enough. But I can't help but believe, especially considering it's the Christian education kickoff, the beginning of school, that we adults sometimes separate ourselves out and say it's kind of a kid thing, a youth thing. Uh, Perhaps we feel, I do as well, I admit, that we've learned everything that we need to learn. They're simple stories in the Bible, after all. Uh, We heard them all when we were a kid. We have them memorized. We know it all. But statistically, less than, and I do mean 43%, according to to a study that was done, 43% of Christians read the Bible once a week, less than. A larger percentage of that don't read it at all. How can we know or walk the walk of of faith and discipleship if we don't study, if we don't read, if if we don't expound the scriptures, if we don't wrestle with God? Probably because they think they already know what's in the Bible is probably why they don't read it, right? I hate to say this, but none of us know the depths of this amazing, wonderful book. I have studied the Bible. I have been to school and learned in both Greek and Hebrew. I have read it all the way through so many times you can't count. My first Bible's falling apart. I know the pages in and out. I can tell you stuff that would blow your mind. And you know what? I am still edified by that book. It's not just a book. It's living, it's breathing, it comes to life. You can read the same passage again and again and again, and it will teach you something different every single time. God will speak to you through those dusty pages. God will breathe life into you just by simply opening it up. So I have to say, in this time of Christian education kickoff, I would encourage you, to figure out a way to wrestle with God, to open the pages of that dusty book and find something within it that challenges you. Find someone who can teach you. Find something new if it's boring, because I can promise you'll always find something new. The Bible is there to be discovered again and again and again, and if you pursue it, you will find it. I want to close today, whether you like him or not, Karl Barth is a favorite of mine. And while I was in seminary at Duke, one of my professors made us read this, and it was one of the most powerful things that I have ever heard. I had to write a paper on it. But you have to forgive the older language. It's from Karl Barth, so it's a little old. But this is called The Strange New World Within the Bible. 
And this will be the close to my sermon today, but it's not without a challenge to you. If you believe that you know what is in the pages of that book, you don't know anything at all. I've made that mistake, and I plan not to make it again. The strange new world within the Bible, we are to attempt to find an answer to the question, what is there within the Bible? What sort of a house is it to which the Bible is a door? What sort of a country is spread out before our eyes when we throw the Bible open? We are with Abraham and Haran. We uh, hear a call which commands him, get out of thy country from thy kindred unto a land that I will show you. We hear a promise, I will make thee a great nation. And Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. What is the meaning of all this? We can but feel that there is something behind these words, experiences. But what? What, are, what is with Moses in the wilderness? For 40 years, he's been living among the sheep, doing penance for an over-hasty act. I will be with thee. Here again are words and experiences which seem first to be nothing but riddles. We do not read it like either the daily papers or other books. What lies behind this book? It is a time of severe oppression in the land of Canaan. Under the oak of Orpha stands the son, Gideon, and the angel of the Lord appears to him and said, Lord is with thee. Thou art ma a man of mighty valor. If the Lord is with us, why has this befallen us, Lord? Go into thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. In the tabernacle of Shiloh lies the young Samuel. Again I call Samuel, Samuel, and the pious priest Eli, to whom runs and wisely advises him to lie down again and listen for God's word. We read all of this, but what do we do? What's behind it? We are aware of something like tremors, an act, an earthquake, like the ceaseless thundering of ocean waves against dikes. But what really is that beat at the barrier that seeks entrance here? We remember how Elijah felt himself called to the Lord to offer defiance to his authority as king. And the Lord was not in the wind, but in a still small voice. Servants of God have struggled fiercely with the question, where is God? And forever gave the answer, Israel hath God for consolation. How in the midst of all the wrongdoing and misery of the people could they blare out in their misery, as it were, the announcement, arise and shine, the risen Lord is upon thee. What does that mean? Why indignation, all the pity, all the joy, all the hope, the unbounded confidence, which even today we see flaring up like a fire from the page of the prophets and the Psalms. Then come the incomprehensible, incomparable days when all previous time and history and experience stand still like the sun at Gibeon in the presence of a man who was no prophet, no poet, no hero, no thinker, and yet all of these and more. And his words cause alarm, for he speaks with authority, not like we ministers. With compelling power, he calls to each one, follow me. Even to the distrustful and the antagonistic, he gives an irresistible impression of eternal life. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the quieter and the lonelier he becomes, and the less real faith he finds in the world about him, the stronger through his whole being peals one triumphant note. I am the resurrection and the life. Because I live, you will live also. And then comes the echo. Weak enough if we compare it with the note of Easter morning and yet strong. Much too strong for our ears, accustomed as they are to the weak, pitiable, weak tones of today. 
the echo which this man's life finds in a little crowd of folk who listen, who watch, and who wait. Here is the echo of the first courageous missionaries who felt the necessity upon them to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Here is the echo of Paul. The righteousness of God is revealed. If any man be found in Christ, he is a new creation. And he has begun, he who has begun a good work in you shall finish it. And then the echo ceases. The Bible is finished. Who is the man who spoke such words and lived such a life? Who set those echoes to ringing? And again, I ask, what's within that Bible? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We are a people of the Reformed faith. Let us all stand and confess our, um, or affirm our faith with the affirmation of faith, which is in your bulletin. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things come together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. Amen. Our middle hymn is hymn num- it's on page 12, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only Wise. Let us pray. 
God of wisdom and knowledge, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn. Make the schools of our community lively centers for sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom. We thank you for teachers and administrators. Continually renew and affirm in them a sense of calling to the sacred vocation of teaching. Give them loving hearts, wise minds, strong spirits, and a passion for their students. Fill them with joy, sustain and strengthen them, and give them rest when they are weary. Let them trust the seeds they plant even when they do not see the harvest. Let them hear deep within themselves your words. Well done, good and trustworthy servant. We thank you for each student, their life among us and the future before them. Lead them in your way, your truth, and your life. Let each classroom they enter be a place of life and light, warmth and welcome, discovery and growth. Give them good friends and let them be good friends for others. Set them at tasks which demand their best efforts and lead them to accomplishments which satisfy and delight. Let them not take failures and disappointments as a measure of their worth, but as opportunities for new learning and new beginnings. Open their hearts to life and their minds to learning. Let holy wisdom be their companion. Send your holy angels to stand guard and keep watch over all students and teachers. Let their names be always on the lips of your saints in prayer. Bless and keep them. Let your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift up your countenance upon them and give them peace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught each of us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers come forward to gather tithes and offerings?
Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding your world with your love. Through the one who gave us himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is The Church's One Foundation. It's on uh, the page 321 in your hymn books. We're going to do the benediction a little different today. I will go ahead and give you your charge, the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds and knowledge and the love of God and the blessing of the Lord, the Almighty Father and Son and Holy Spirit remain with you all. Now, we are all going to give the benediction. Okay, so it's on page 701 in your hymn book, and we probably know it, but we're going to sing it to each other, okay? All right, because pastors, uh, pastors need that too sometimes. And don't forget afterwards, we're going to be meeting down uh, in the Crawford Center. So, you know, when you walk out the door, you know where, where to find it. So here's how it goes. We've got a note. Wow, that's high. Lord, Lord prepare. Help me out a little bit more. Me, bear me. There we go. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and 